as you all know that this is the text for the individuals, meaning that for the salaried employees. So I'll be doing learning unit one and learning unit two. All right, uh, the learning unit one, we are dealing with the introduction to income tax or the taxation itself, right? So the background, which is mostly your introductions, right? I've just noted that most of our citizens, we are actually faced up with the reality of paying tax in anyhow. So in anyhow, it means that we've got, there's no denial that we've got different types of tax in South Africa, all right? Starting from the tax that you pay as you are working, or the tax that you buy when you that you pay when you purchase goods, which is called the value added tax. We've got things like your CGT, that's your capital gains tax, your donation tax, your dividends tax, your estate duty tax, and so forth. But in here, we're going to deal with not a lot of number of tax, but quite a few of them. Most of it, it will be the income tax for the salaries employee right so basically is if you are working the chances of the chances of you paying tax are quite high all right but we'll get into the details of that as when as and when goes by right looking at your number 1.2 where it deals with the national budget okay um i mentioned that each year the finance minister which is currently tito Boini, this man announced what the government spending will be for the next three years mostly but the, the updates towards the, the, the South African citizen happens on a yearly basis. I think for this year, it has already passed. But if you need more information on that, you can go to the website for SARS. You will get more details on that. Right. Let me tell you, the easiest part about this whole thing is we don't use the textbook this year. The study guide should be sufficient enough. I'm not sure if you guys are going to write the written exam or you're going to write the multiple choice exam. But either way, it should be and easy for you if you understand your work um, fair enough. But the major part of the government income uh, derives from the tax. There's no denial about that. The government tax its citizens that they're making the money so that they can raise their own revenue. Okay. And the government physicals year differ from the individual, which ends on the 31st of March, while the individual year ends on the 28th or the 29th of every year. Right. Moving down there on 1.3, uh, we're now going to explain SARS. But before I get into SARS, going back to the national budget there, I need to emphasize to you guys that there is a difference between the Treasury and the South African Reserve um, Services. Those are two entities in there, but they work hand in hand or all together. This is how they work. The national budget, it comes from the Treasury. Treasury meaning that they are responsible to make any amendment or the, any changes with regards to the increase or the decrease with regards to any types of tax rates, right? SARS, what they do normally is they just administer that, right? Meaning that they're getting the delegations from the National Treasury Department and they do what the Treasury Department tells them what to do, right? Again, if you can recall quite well, I think three to four years back, there was an increase with regards to the Fed from 14 to 15%. We got that announcement from the Treasury Department. SARS didn't just say, okay, we are deciding on today that we are going to increase our, our Fed. Right, of course, there are aims that the in provision of SARS there, which they are enhanced. It aims to provide an enhanced, transparent, and client oriented service to ensure optimum and equitable collection of SARS, okay? Their main reason is they collect SARS, sorry, they collect tax from, from the people, and that's how they actually raise their revenue. Right. But their main collection is to collect and administer the national tax or duties or levies. I think I've emphasized enough on that one. So they also collect revenue that may be imposed under any other legislation agreed between SARS and the government. Right. As I said before, the agreement should be in between the Treasury Department and SARS. What I'm trying to say or explain, or what they're trying to say here is, SARS cannot just say, this year we are going to tax people 15% or 28% or whatever the amount for that. You understand? They need to get that approval, the agreement from the Treasury Department. Right, point three, provide protection against all illegal importation and exportation of the goods, right? So this normally happens when we cross the border or when they 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 they, they the, the, should I say the foreigners or the immigrations when they cross in our border, 
any other goods when they cross in our border. There's what's called the importation tax or the exportation tax, meaning that when you're providing a service or when you're selling goods outside, obviously in that country that you are actually selling the goods, they will charge you what's called the exportation tax. Or if goods are coming to our country in here, so usually let's say for example, um, true it, let's say they buy their clothes in, I'm just giving an example, in Italy. Immediately when the goods are landing at the airport for the shipment, so what, what is going to happen is they need to charge them what's called the importation tax, right? Because they are going to sell that to raise their business revenue. But facilitation of trade is mainly for selling or they advise all the ministers regarding all the revenue matters. So that will be mainly the Minister of Finance. That's currently your Tijombaweni. Right, I've noted that there is a tax table with, with its weight on page 22, which is established in accordance with how the individuals are taxed and how they earn, the, how they earn including their, how they earn including their ages as well. Right, this, this thing works in this way. You will see that when we do, when we get more questions with regards to tax, okay, you realize that um the issue of age plays a major role when you do your tax calculations all right they will tell you they will tell you at a certain age you qualify to be under this kind of a tax bracket and the issue of income itself i'm talking about the gross income before any other allowable deductions it plays a major role as well the issue of the disability it plays a major role as well and the issue of the marriage how you get married with your partner, it plays a major role as well. Whether it's anti or whether it's in community or property or whatever the type of marriage, it it actually plays a major role in that one. So um, quickly, you can, uh, if you've got your chart for the, what is it, um, your learning unit one, you can just check on page 22, but we'll be able to do more questions as time goes by. So I don't think at this point in time is actually um, important for you guys to actually can go there. Right, the fortunate part is we don't deal with company tax or we, or, or we don't deal with the CC tax. They deal, they're dealt with, I think it's second year or third year. But we know that at this stage, companies and CC, they pay tax at 28%. Right. Um, so at this point in time, you guys don't have to worry about uh, the company tax as well as the CC tax. But looking at the different types of tax in South Africa, but in this context, we're going to deal with not all, but some, which I included, I think I've mentioned that. You remember I gave you the list with regards to your income tax, your that, your salaries tax, and all of those, right? I mentioned this one as well. Salary tax, it depends on how much you earn based on your tax brackets. The reality is we earn differently, so it means that we have to pay tax differently. But we're going to deal with a small piece of a donation tax at a 10% rate. Uh, I don't think that has changed as well. And then the C CGT capital tax, capital gains tax, it's actually at 40%, but that's your last study unit. It is part of your, your content. Right, there's a small piece of dividends tax at 20%. It's there, but it's not that much. It's more like the donation tax. Right, let's look at the number four, which deals with the basis for and types of taxation. Right. We as the residents, we are mostly taxed on the income that we earn domestically and across the globe. And non-residents are taxed only in on the income that they earn in South Africa or in the country. Basically, what it means is we have developed to a stage where people are earning not only their salaries, but multiple income, right? We've seen that developing in the states where people are having double jobs and stuff like that, right? So the other people are you'd be working somewhere else and maybe say, OK, let me just develop a property where I can actually find people that they can rent on it. So I want the disclosure with regards to that one. OK, you are selling items like food or you're selling clothes or you're selling, let's say, used vehicles and stuff like that. That kind of income has to be disclosed as part of your gross income. Right. Let's say you've got a relationship business with the people in the USA, America, Nigeria, London, wherever. That kind of income, because at the end of the day, is going to be transferred to you as a resident in the country. It has to be disclosed to SARS. 
so that they will be able to text you on that. Right. Looking at point two there, it says that a government has entered into what's called the double tax agreement. If you've gone through your summary or if you've gone through your study units, you've seen that with various countries, mainly to avoid double taxation, which will be unfair to the taxpayer. Imagine you earn an income in London or you earn an income in Ghana, for example, and so South Africa not be involved with that country in terms of avoiding double tax agreement. It means that you will be taxed in that country. And then when your incomes arrives in the country, you will be taxed again, which is unfair, right? So the fairness part of it, it comes out in the in a sense that you should be taxed only once, right? You're going to get your income in there. It will be transferred into, into your account in this country, and South Africa will be able to tax you on that one. That's what we mean when you talk about the double tax agreement. Right, I think I've mentioned point number three there where I said the Treasury Department is responsible for tax rates changes. SARS administer and collect on behalf of the Treasury Department. Right, so there is no way that the Treasury Department can work alone. They need to work with SARS. Okay, you can see there I've written down with my red big pen. I said that the bigger question is always that who is responsible for the burden of paying tax? Right. I'm going to ask everybody actually to unmute yourself and answer this question with me. Please, who bears the burden of paying tax and why? Let's break it down, please. Anybody quickly? Any Anybody who might have a, a little bit of an answer to, 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 to this one? The person who is responsible for the burden of paying tax is anyone who is working. Anyone who is working? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you think it's fair enough and why do you, why do you think individuals should actually pay tax? Why not the companies or why not the manufacturers or why not the, the government? Why why don't the government pay tax on our behalf? Or why don't companies pay tax on our behalf? It's not going to be enough to 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 help the, the government to to help the economy. To help the economy. So to help the economy, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Lesero. Okay, let me break it down to you in this way. Nobody, nobody, nobody's happy about paying tax despite the fact that we feel like tax is too much, okay? It's a bit of a bad end for, for, for us. But look at how the sheaves with regards to who pays tax works, okay? There's a manufacturer of goods. Let's say Tega Brands, for example, they manufacture oats, um, all of those of their products there. What they do is, if they have VAT registered, they would impose VAT on their product. They sell it to, uh, to the distributors, the distributors will be like, mm -mm, this is too much for me. And then what do they do? They impose it again on the um, on, on the retailers. And the retailers will be, no, but we shouldn't be responsible for that because you guys, why are you guys not paying? But the final users of the goods will be responsible for that. And it's going to be me and you. We cannot run away from that because there are certain goods that when you buy at the store, you don't have a choice. They've got what's called the bad attraction. Okay? And... That's how entirely SARS is actually making money, or that's how they raise their revenue. But it doesn't end there. They don't just make money and put it in the bank account. You understand? There's an infrastructure that has to be provided, okay? We've got rails, we've got roads, we've got street lights, we've got hospitals that we have to go there and take care of our health. And there's so many things that the government will do with what we pay on our tax. And I'm not saying that people should say, but our government are eating our money. The cabinet is eating our money and all of those. I'm just looking at the positive side of it. Basically, that's how the shift with regards to the tax works. Right. So you would pay your VAT, you would go to work, you would get your salary. The government will still, I mean, SARS would still charge you for that. They would say, you fall under this category in terms of the bracket, and this is how you actually have to pay your tax. We'll see that when you do a few examples on the learning unit too. Right, let's see what's, what's next. Interpretation of the tax law and the legal remedies. Okay, we've got two rules here, which is the interpretation rules, which says that the interpretation rules are issued by SARS and with the application of the specific sections, which are based on the SARS legal opinion on how the applicable legislation should be interpreted. Okay, let me tell you something, guys. 
I know most of the people in the country, they're scared of SARS. Even if you're not happy about your tax returns or the assessments, you'd be like, okay, no, it's okay. I'll make arrangements with them so that I can pay whatever that I owe them. But the reality is, if you don't feel happy about the outcome of your assessment, you call it or you make an arrangements or you dispute that and say, I'm not happy about the outcome you gave me. This is how I understand my thing. You've got the legal right to actually can do that. Okay, looking at number two there, there's a dispute uh, resolution. There's a process that you have to follow. You don't just say, ah, Sar says that I owe them and I'm going to dispute it. You don't just go vocal, you act. All right, it entails the legal procedure that the taxpayer may follow should they disagree with the output assessment from SARS, to try and reach an agreement on what the interpretation should be. And believe me, in many cases, people have queried or made some dispute, and the, the resolution favored them at the end of the day. You understand? I mean, SARS is an entity like any other entity that makes a mistake. And the mistake that has been made, it has to be rectified, only if you know your way or your path around that. Let's look at the turnaround time. You, you as a taxpayer, you are entitled to request the SARS within 30 days of issuing the ITA 34 for any errors that might be caused by SARS. Looking at, okay, within 30 days, you've got the right to say SARS, I'm not happy about the outcome that I got from you. How about this? Okay, obviously you will look at your, what's called the ITA 34. That's your assessment. Actually, that's, uh, the results that you got when you received your, sorry, when you processed your, your, your tax returns. Point three, the objections might be completed on ADR4 slash forward NOO. There's a form that should the taxpayer feels dissatisfied with the outcome, they will appeal at the alternative dispute resolution or tax board, tax court, depending on the circumstances. In certain situations, you will try and dispute whatever the outcome that you got from SARS. But it's not always the time where they're going to give you the feedback that will be within your satisfactory. And you feel like the, the feedback that they gave me after the dispute is actually not enough, you have to complete this form called the ADR and OO form. And it's either you've got three options here where you can appeal it, which is your alternative dispute resolution, or tax board, or the tax code, depending on your circumstances. Right, that brings us to the end of our learning unit one. I did not see your assignment, but I would like to believe that most of you have submitted or you are in attempt of submitting your assignment one. Theoretical questions under your assignment. Anything is possible to be coming out of your assignment or out of your exam. Okay, in any of this. But the other thing that I want to advise you guys on is be careful of your first learning units because they build a foundation towards your upcoming content or learning units. Right, it's okay. If you don't get along with it at the beginning, it's okay. Make sure that you create time to actually can repeat that. And believe me, it will, it will help you, right? And it won't be a coincidence if you get a multiple choice question and they say, who is the current minister of treasury, right? They give you a list of whole ministers there. And it's possible that some of the students, they don't even know is Tito Bowen, okay? Or you can get a question that, when is the individual year of assessment ending? All right, they give you different days there. Some students, they don't even know that is the 28th or the 29th of February every year for tax, all right? Or they can ask you, what are the main core functions of SARS? If you don't know them, that's gonna be a problem. And you didn't know them because of, uh, you're stupid. You didn't know them because of you didn't give your studies much more enough time. Happy about that? Yes. All right. There is a text table. This one I've um, noted it down there. Please make sure that you go to your study guide and mention that on page 22, you'll find your text tables. But it's going to be easy for you because we'll be dealing with a lot of questions that would require us to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with regards to the text tables. And, I'm begging you guys, if you do not understand it, please, please, please. Even if it takes you to send me an email, it's okay. Because sometimes people are not comfortable in speaking a group. If you don't feel comfortable in, in talking to a group, make sure you send me an email and I'll respond as soon as I get it. 
it's not always the time where I'm going to respond and respond to you best uh, what is it convenient, but I will definitely get back to you and respond. OK, I just want you guys to actually move forward. Do this, understand it, pass and move forward. You understand? I don't like it when people are coming repeatedly in my in my class. Right now I can move on. Let me see if there's anything that I can. Uh, maybe you can get a question of um, true or false, a multiple choice question with regards to residents and non-residents in terms of how do they get taxed or the issue of the double tax agreement, right? Or like I said, the Treasury Department as opposed to SARS. All right, out of the first learning unit that we did, um, did you guys, um, did, do you guys have any assignment question that would affect the learning unit one? There were quite a few, like the one that you just mentioned now. Um, when is the tax? Um, what is this? When is that? For the individual. The one that you just mentioned earlier, the individual tax. Um, the individual tax, yes. Yes. Is it part of it? The question was, yes, the question was in there. And then they also asked about the fiscal year. And like the one that you also asked, um, who's the minister of, of, of finance? Oh, uh, you got that. In my assignment. Yes, I got that in my first assignment. Ah, it means you see, guys, I qualified to examine your paper. <laughs> I didn't see your assignment, but I just, I just assumed of what might be the possible questions in your assignment. Thank you so much for that. So I hope you guys all got it right. Is, is the assignment due already, or is it, is it still coming to you? Right, let's have a look at your learning unit two, your salaried, uh, salaried person and the income tax, right? Basically, this learning unit, it entirely talks about you earning a salary and starts taxing you out of your salary. Okay, it's a compliance guide, it's a legislation. You cannot do anything to say, I can pay tax. You have to pay tax out of your salaries. Of course, there are those who doesn't qualify to pay the tax. And unfortunately, some of us or some of you um, have to bear the burden of paying the tax. Right, let's look at the background. We'll be looking at the different steps followed by SARS in collecting their revenue tax for the year of assessment towards their salaries and employees. But the nice part about this, even though it's quite an expenditure for most of us, is our employers are doing it on our behalf. Okay, it's not you who compile all these papers on a monthly basis and say, this is my pay as you have, and then you hand it over to some. Imagine the volume or imagine how many people would be on SARS. I cannot take it there myself, to be honest. Okay, I'm lucky so that my employers are doing it for me, so that I don't just have to worry about it. And I'll be knowing as to how much is my net to be reflected on my bank account on whatever the day, payday that I'm getting it. Right, any salary? Employees usually earn or receive a pay slip from their employer which stipulate how much they earn and the deduction pays on their gross salaries. This more similar, this other day I was asking my friends, but guys, how many of you draw your statements on a monthly basis and check how much you spend on your charges? They don't know, all they know is they receive their salary, they don't even stress about how much are they earning. Sorry, they don't even stress about how much is the bank charging them and stuff like that. So I advise them that guys, please draw your statement and check how much you are paying. People are paying a lot of money. Okay, so it's the same as um, employees. They send you the payslip, your employer send you the place, the payslip, whether it's manual or whether it's electronically. At the end of the day, you'll be like, okay, I just want to see if this money goes into my bank account. I don't want to check how much am I paying for my medical aid. I don't, mind, I don't want to check how much am I paying for my pension. I don't even care how much am I paying for my son. The fact remains, I have planned for this as my net, and I'm going to work on my net. It's quite wrong because this thing changes on a regular basis, if not again. Right, so please do check your salaries, guys. Same applies to your bank, bank, uh, bank statement. We do that in accounting basically under the learning unit called the cash and cash equivalents. So that's usually one of the questions, uh, what is it? One of the questions that I do ask them. But income tax, income tax, which is the payee. So employee pays tax payee towards SARS via their employer as part of their deductions, 
a pay term agreement basis. It can be weekly, or fortnight, or a monthly basis. Let's not forget about that in our country, there are people who still end their salary on a weekly basis. It's called the wages. That those that they end their salaries on a monthly, uh, what is it, on a fortnight, on a fortnight night basis, I would like to believe that that's still the wages. That's two months. Sorry, that's two weeks in a month. What? That those that they get their salaries on a monthly basis. Okay, you know that you get paid on the 15th, the 20th, the 25th, the 27th, or the last day of the month. But salaries in provision of the employers with regards to the tax card on a yearly basis, indicating how much of the tax should be, should the employee pay on their gross salaries. They usually update the employer on a yearly basis with regards to how much has their tax changes with regards to how much does your employer get on a yearly basis. Remember, you're not going to get away with that thing of, uh, okay, my employer gave me an 8% increase. The more you get an increase, the more you pay your tax. There's no denial about that. You'll never go, you'll never run away. Pension or provident fund, I hope you guys can see my letters here because they are, actually, I think they have forgot to change them. They are actually in a very small size. But your pension, provident fund, and contributions, okay? Um, this mostly applies to most of the permanent stops. So you may find out that you do your pension or you pay your provident fund contributions. It's mostly when you retire, okay? So it's based on a certain percentage regarding to your gross income. So you basically, you pay a certain portion or a certain amount from your gross income towards whoever the fund member pays. Okay, so, but it, it's in most cases, it applies to permanent stuffs. Unemployment insurance funds, contributions. I don't know how many employer have I had in this country. I don't know how many times have I claimed my UIF, okay? But the reality is I've claimed it, right? Um, I've claimed it. I think I've been fortunate enough to actually can change employer from one um, from one space to another. Now, that's, that's besides the point anyway. So your UIF contributors is usually 1% of your gross salaries, okay? Um, the employer do pay as well, and you pay as an employee, but you'll pay 1% towards your own, what is it, UIF contributions for the future to be covered. A certain income should they lose their jobs. In most cases, when women go to maternity for a certain period, contribution is made to what SAS or to was the UIF commission. But here's the thing, guys, when your employer pay a certain portion on your behalf to a certain member or organization. In, in tax, we call that a fringe benefit. We'll deal with a specific lending unit that deals with the word, the term, fringe benefit. You will see on how it has been established and how we deal with, with it. It's quite interesting, very interesting. Right, so I'm just surprised when you guys are saying that it's a bit tough because it's one of the easiest uh, modules ever. Medical aid scheme contributions. But medical aid scheme contribution, I still value this up until today. It's important for everybody to have a medical aid contribution. Okay? Because you never know, when your health deteriorates, you would need these people. Right? So every employee who belongs to a medical aid must contribute a certain amount depending on how, much, how many members are covered. Most often, the employer contribute a certain portion of its employees as well, right? So as I said before, you will find this item, this tab, when we deal with the, when we deal with the fringe benefit part, because most of the medical aid scheme members, their employers, they pay a certain portion towards um, medical aid scheme firms, right? Still called the fringe benefits. Sometimes you may find that the employer is paying 40% and then you pay 60% of your salary. All right, and one more thing with regards to the medical aid scheme contribution is definitely you guys, even if you work on the, with the same employer on the same level, the chances are you're not gonna pay the same amount. Reason number one being, you guys might be allocated or you can choose two different, uh, what is it, medical aid firms. That would make a difference with regards to your contributions, okay? The amount of keys that you have is not exactly the same amount I have for my 
dependence. You may find out that you've got three, I've got one, or I've got five, and that kind of a different number actually makes a difference in terms of how we all pay. Okay, we'll do, we'll see questions when we get down there. There's a lot of questions that we're gonna do today, but it's just examples, right? We're gonna come to major, uh, what is it, questions, uh, probably sometime next week. Employees, okay, let's look at the membership fees. I always hear this when I listen to 702s. They would invite some guests to say, I've joined this club, uh, what is it, Garden Club or the Tea Club. But if you've subscribed to certain organization with regards to, I just gave an example with regards to the Tea Garden Club or the Pool Club, pays, may choose pay, sorry, may choose to pay their monthly subscription fee from their salary. Obviously, there will be a little bit of arrangements with regards to employer in the salary division to tell them that I want this to be deducted of my money to go through to this kind of an organization. So the other source of income, we spoke about that. Employees that are making income elsewhere, they need to actually can disclose that. Okay, it's an obligation, guys. Please do not run away because because the reality of the of the matter, guys, is SARS is not a good department to deal with when they are behind you. They can chronicalize you. So the sooner the better. If you've got anything that you are hiding, make sure that you disclose that. Right. How many of you heard of the word IRP5 certificate? I'm going to open up this for, for a question, right? Anybody quickly? Who heard? Who knows what the IRP5 is? It's the 10 now. Everybody's looking for the IRP5. They'll be like, I want my IRP because I need to submit my returns. But the reality is we don't submit returns for the sake of following the process. We submit it with the connotation that we would receive a certain amount of money. We all want the refund. How many of you are getting the IRP file from your employer? Um, I do. You do? Yes. Okay. Did you get your yeah. refund? No, I haven't submitted my tax returns actually. Oh, you haven't submitted that? No, I haven't. Okay. However, though, what I do know, because I do have my IRP file just in front of me, so what I've noticed is that I do have um, my annual income that is listed on my IRC file. I also noticed that my medical aid contributions also are listed for the UCD. Um, Sorry, you said your medical aid has lifted? My medical aid contributions are also listed. Oh, they, they also lifted by, by your employer? By my employer, because also the employer has got a certain amount of them that they contribute towards the medical aid itself. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now I understand first why was it high, or what is it, uh, uplifted or increased? But one of the questions that we do, it will tell you why. Okay. But you should just bear in mind that the Minister of Finance already gave his budget speech. I got my IRP5, um, I think, three weeks back. Yeah. And then I, I was auto assessed. However, I'm not really happy with the auto assessment. So now it gives me a chance to refer back to my IRP5 and then just make a comparison if everything is um, accurate. Okay, um, I've got a question for you there. The learning unit that we did, um, do you think it's going to help you to actually can lodge a complaint or? A reassessment? Oh, definitely, definitely. It, it, you know it's the definitely process. going to help you. Yeah, I have an idea, and it's okay. actually making it clearer for me because I'm actually dealing with it currently with my own um, individual tax issues. Oh, so no, it's going. That's, that's, it's definitely going to help me with this no, with this um, module. No, that's that's lovely. Give them thirty days, and then you can lodge your complaint. Okay. I hope you mm -hmm. guys just come up to an agreement of some sort. All right. IRP5 certificate is it's a certificate that you get from your employer. You normally get it once in a year. They allow you to submit your returns so that you'll be knowing where you're standing is what sucks. By standing, I mean whether you owe them or they owe you, or there's just a break given. Okay, but out of the three, one must be established. It's either you owe them or they owe you, or you are just on a mail. Okay. Just for your information, if you've got a credit of about 50 rand or anything less than 100 rand, you guys don't qualify to get that amount of money. They only pay you if it's 100 rand or more. 
Right, you get that so that at the end of the year, each employer must pro must provide the employee with an IPF certificate to assist them in completing the tax returns. Well, the IRP5 contains the information with regards to you as the employee, your employer, including all this. If you've got your IRP5 now, check it after the class. You will see the information with regards to you, the information with regards to your employer, it has what's called the source codes, right? Meaning that each and every income or expenditure item it has its own source code there. Be a medical aid, be provident fund, be gross income. There are source codes in there. You will see them, they're written source codes. They are in numbers. I think they're about four or three in your IRP file or five. Right, so, all right, let's do this. Let's quickly go to the sample of IRP file in page 36 of all tabs. Right. So you guys can see that in text we deal with reality here. We don't just read for the sake of reading, practice for the sake of practicing. We deal with your relationship between you or the relationship between you, your employer, SARS, as well as Treasury, to have an idea of what the IRP file look like. But it's there in your study guide. It's page what? 36 on tab 103. Okay, uh, not not all the information I'm looking for is actually here, but all the details with regards to you as the employee and the employer and all of those, they're here. The only thing that is missing here is the figures and the ID number, obviously, they can just pick up any other any other ID number and the source codes. Okay, source codes, mainly they are on your third page. So this is how the IRP5 looks like. Anyway, when you do the tax return submissions, you don't mm -hmm. only need the IRP5. You only need the mm -hmm. IRP5 if you don't belong to a med Sorry, sounds like somebody wants to speak here. As I was saying that, the, the IRP5 is not the only important document that you have to receive from your employer for the submission of your tax returns. If you belong to a medical aid, we need the medical certificate. If you belong to any certain investment account that you have with your bank, we need that kind of a certificate. Um, there are people who travel at work that they need to keep what's called the logbook. Okay, it's part of your fringe benefit. You will see that when we progress with the content. You need that for the submission along with your IR, IRP file. So if you have already submitted your IRP file and you feel like some of the documents were missing, you've got the time to actually can readjust that. But one thing I like about SARS is immediately when you submit, they pre-populate that under your e-filing, even if you do it manually. Immediately when you give them your ID number, they will see that there's a document that is missing, unless it is not updated by your employer. Then that's where the problem would be. Okay, IRP5 would be uh, on page 36. But for your information, guys, it's I know there are questions that I've seen previously, under the rating exam papers, they gave them a sample of an IRP file for, and they told them to actually, obviously with an information of an additional information, told them to update or fill in the IRP file. Anything is possible. That's how interesting this course is. Let's look at 2.3, 2 the person liable for income tax. Let me just put it up there. Taxpayer up to a certain age do not pay tax up to a certain amount and we refer to those amounts as tax rise hold. I'll see you that. Um, they are, I'll show you that they're actually on page 37. This, the, the, there's a thing in tax called the tax rise hold, right? So that's why when I was on learning unit one, I was telling you about how important the age factor is because um, how important the age factor is as well as the gross income because you'll be able to determine whether you do qualify to pay that the tax or not. Okay, but if you want to see that kind of price, what is it, price hold, you have to go to page 37 of your study guide, I think it's in 102, and then you will see at least in terms of the categories of those kind of people who are suitable for that tax price hold. But it changes every year as the ministers makes an announcement. So you can see that all these announcements are not coming from SARS. SARS just administer you from uh, your employer. However, the minister is the one who's actually making the amendments with regards to certain age factors, certain in, uh, income group class, uh, with regards to this kind of um, your tax price ward. It's merely a deduction with regards to your primary 
the, your, your primary, secondary, and tertiaries. But it goes along with your pages. You will see that on page 37. I think I'm going to open it just now. now. All right, if you've got your tab there, I'm going to ask you to go to page 37, and we'll see on how the category or the table looks like. Right, so the text rise was applicable to individuals for 2020 to 2021 for the year of assessment. Let's look at their taxable income along with the uh, age and the income. If the person is under the age of 65 and you earn an amount of 83,100, it means that your annual rebate that's limited to primary with a limit amount of 14,958. Okay, and we we'll also look at the tax. Uh, the Taxable income framework and see where well, then you need two features. Right, person with an age of 65 and older with an income of 128,650, they qualify for primary as well as the secondary rebates. So, primary rebates is the same amount, but secondary is 8199. Let's look at the category number three where the person is 75 years of age and older. Okay, so these are the retired um, um, staff members. So if your income is 143,850, uh, you qualify for all three, which is your primary, secondary, and tertiary. Again, these kind of equation you may find it under your multiple choice. They can actually, they like this thing, to be honest with you. They like it, they like it so much. Not with the multiple, but with the previous exam papers that were written, I've seen that it was actually most of the time there. So I've never seen any of your multiple choice questions if you guys are continuing to write the multiple choice questions or if you guys are writing the what's called the rating assignments, okay? Okay, I didn't tell you this. Um, guys, it's, it's not my responsibility to give you assignment solutions. You need to bear that in mind. However, if you've got a question, you're more than welcome to actually, don't ask me, you can ask me any questions in the assignment. I won't give you the answer, but I can give you the process on how you can arrive at the exact answer. I hope that makes sense to you. Right, one more time. It's not my responsibility to assist you with your assignments, but it's my, 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 my responsibility to give you the process of the steps that you have to follow in order for you to get to your final answer. I hope that's quite clear. Righty, let's have a look at, all right, using the table in terms of the categories. Right, let's look at the registration as a taxpayer. Any persons who ends a salary above the tax price, all of them must register the tax, and registration can be done by, a, by an employer or the e-filing system or at the SARS WAP. I think I wanted to say the SARS branch just to do it manually, but the practitioners can also act on your behalf. Right, SARS has these people that they call the tax practitioners. What they do is they give you what's called the practice number and you work like doctors or they may call it a license, right? Meaning that they give you the authority to perform any tax duties on behalf of taxpayers, right? So if you don't want to queue or you don't want to go through uh, the e-filing, what you have to do is you take all your documentation and then you give them to the, this person. Right. Uh, I'd like to believe that they are safe and I'd like to believe that they know what they're doing. But of course, you can't just submit things here for the registrations just alone. All you need is meet the certain documents that are required for various employees where they are from and with regards to their age. But here's the thing. Most of the media industry people, they were in tax problems simply because they've got kids that they do adverts or they've got kids that they do various projects they don't register them for tax, and that's wrong. If you've got any kids who's actually any income somehow, make sure that you register your kid for tax, okay? You will go there as their parent to hold their custody, and that will be it, as easy as that. Tax is not paid by older people only. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so in your case, whether your ID is certified or uncertified, or your proof of address, but they need that, and then you can just receive If it's via the e-filing, then you can scan your document and send them through. If it's via the branch, obviously they would need that, and they need to register for you, okay? If you are, if you're from any part of the country except, sorry, any part out of the country except South Africa, they would need your Aslam seekers, 
for your passport as well as your approval address. So, if it's your child with a minor, any in income, obviously we're going to need one of the parental ID and they're going to need your child's ID as well, depending on where the child comes from. Okay, let's see. I'm going to move on. Now, what? Mention there that page 38 is a condition of employee you must submit and not submit their tax returns, depending on the SARS terms. I cannot pass on this one. We have to go to page 38. All right, as we were on uh, registration as a taxpayer with SARS, Let's have a look at where it says when an individuals are not required to submit their income tax return. It um, says that an individual is not required to submit an income tax return if their gross income is considered solely of the following. It's a total employment income or salary for the year before tax. That's your gross income for the whole year. Was not more than 500,000 rent. And if you only receive an employment income salary for the full year of assessment from one employer, meaning that if you don't have multiple incomes, right, and you don't have any car allowance, I think I spoke about that with regards to your fringe benefit part, company car, or travel allowance, or other income. All of this then are going to be catered under your fringe benefit um, when we, we move forward. And then if you're not claiming tax related to deductions or the rebates, things like your medical expense, retirement, annuity contributions, and other pension contributions made by your employer. Your employee tax pay has been deducted with her by your employer, okay? Because you need to be very careful. There are employers out there who claim that they pay tax on your behalf and they deduct that money, but they never pay that amount of money towards SARS, okay? Interest income from a source in the Republic not exceeding 28,000 in the case of individual below the age of 65. There's a condition there. Your age factor should be below, sorry, should be below 65. Or 34,500 in the case of an individual aged above the age of 65. 23,800 in the case of the estate of a deceased person. Dividends and individuals were non-resident for the 2020 year of assessment. And the amount received were accrued for the tax-free investment. Most of us, we do have that. One that you've got investment with the bank that they don't tax you the interest that you earned, or you may call it the dividends. All right, should you not, uh, you should not have, you should have noted that the thrice or 500,000 refers to individual taxpayers who are no longer required to file a return. It does not mean that taxpayer must lend less than 500,000 a year, no longer pay income tax, okay? The fact that you're not filing the return, it mean, doesn't mean that you have to not pay tax. Filing thrice hold is not the same as the tax thrice hold. There's a filing and there's a thrice hold. We dealt with that in our currents with the primary, secondary, and tertiary. Tax thrice hold refers to the amount when a taxpayer doesn't have to pay tax or have to pay a payee deducted. Refer to section two. I'm sure you would agree with me that we touched based on. Please make sure you go home and read this before you attempt any questions, or you can go home and read in conjunction with attempting your question, or you can just do them as an integration. That's okay, okay? Because you'll be testing your theory into practice. When are individuals required to submit their income tax returns? These are the people that they, they, they are obliged or they are required by the law of SARS, the treasury to submit their tax returns, basically SARS, because they administer. Where a taxpayer conducted any trade in South Africa or if a South African tax resident conducted a trade, well, that includes your spaza shop or your chani bao shop. And when a taxpayer receives an allowance such as a travel allowance, subsistence, or office bear allowance, if the taxpayer holds any funds in a foreign currency, we touch based on that one, right? Remember that I gave you types of multiple income that you get from different sources. Right, where taxpayers realize that a capital gain or capital loss exceed 40,000 rent in a year. All right, guys, you only realize or recognize what's called the capital gains. You'll see that when you do learning in seven. Capital gains, it's actually applicable when you dispose or when you sell your asset, okay? It's either you're gonna sell it at a profit or you're gonna sell it at a loss. But there are processes that has to be followed with regards to that. You will see that when we do Lenny Unit 7. One thing I like about this tax is what holds on Lenny Unit 2, you'll find it in Lenny Unit 3. 
either way, you don't have a choice. And you will find it in Learning Unit 4. You will find it in Learning Unit 5, 6, or 7. They are all integrated. That's why it's important to understand the theory that you study so that when you put that into practice, it should relate. I hope I'm making sense of it well. Right, capital gain, is, oh, we did that, we passed that. When a taxpayer holds any rights in a controlled foreign, <coughs> sorry, company, in most cases, this one are shares. We've got a lot of foreigners from the UK. Actually, the UK and the USA, they've got companies that they've controlled here. You can tell them, your Wimpy's, your McDonald's, your Virgin Active and all of those, your discoveries and everything, if I'm not mistaken. Right, uh, let me move to the income tax returns. I'm just gonna quickly move on to my notes. This is where I am. I think I have to do my thing off, stop sharing, then I share. And then you all can see that, right? If you don't see that, please tell me. Right, taxpayers are required to submit their returns on a yearly basis by the IP. ITR trial populated on the subs. Okay. So your IRP5 represent what's called the ITA34, right? And then when you when you process your claims with SARS, that's called an ITR12. That's basically on your system. I don't know. Whoever that did the e-filing or have gone to the branch, you would see that the amount that you have on your IRP5, they are mostly oftenly exactly the same amount that SARS have on their system. Right. But here is the thing that people do not understand. You get a refund simply because you overpaid. You don't get a refund because you have to get a refund. There's a reason behind the reason why you get the, the refund. And then you owe SARS simply because you underpaid your tax and you break even because everything was just perfect. Right. So uh, submissions can also done via the e-filing, pretty much as you can do it on the registration site or the SARS branch or the, by the tax practitioners. Those are the people that they obviously will pay if they do that. Okay, documentation required. We are actually on page 39. There's no need for us to actually go to page 39 because we explained that. You need your IRP file, you need your ID, you need your investment certificate, your medical aid certificate, and your travel logbook. All right, let's see. Income tax assessment. The process required to be followed by the calculations of the tax returns. They are on page. I think I forgot to show you the page on that. Basically, that's your results after the, what is it submitting, whether you owe SARS or you're on a break even or they owe you. So that's the three that can be established when it comes to their income tax. Income tax framework. You need to know this. You all need to know this. It's not going to be given in the exam. You need to know all the steps, where and which one fits where. That's your responsibility. Let's all turn to page 42. That's very important. Uh, quickly, you guys, I need you guys to go to page 42. You need to know on how the framework looks like. Right, yeah. the framework starts at the top there with the gross income. That includes your special inclusion on the fringe benefits. I spoke a little bit or touch based on the fringe benefit. Your lump sum. Their taste, they are, they are, they are, they are um, taxed differently. And then you've got what's called your exempt income, and that gives you a total of your income. All of these incomes that you have that they do qualify to be under your income, including your salaries and everything, they will fall there. Okay. If you look at your far right on top, you'd see that we'll cover that under your lending unit three and five. We're not there yet. Agree? Right, so that kind of a calculations will give you uh, what's called an exempt income. This is, let's look at the relation. Those that, that are doing accounting, just want to step out a little bit. Those that are doing FAC, you would see that, you would realize that somewhere along your studies when you do what's called the sales, that's your revenue, okay? You would have your sales, and you would have something like sales returns. It's more similar to this one because you'd say your sales, you minus your sales returns, it gives you the net sales. Okay, so that's more similar like that one. Bear that in mind. And then you're going to have your allowable deductions. If you look at your, at your far right there, you will see that your allowable deductions are on Lenny Unit 4 and Lenny Unit 3. Can you all see that? I've mentioned there, 
taxable capital gains, meaning that you do you need to do your little separations with regards to your CGT calculations. Whatever the figure that you have, you're going to put it in here. You'll add the tax capital gain. Same applies to you if you've got the tax capital loss. It's going to be put in there as your deduction. I hope everybody else is actually happy about that. OK, let me tell you something nice when I was teaching these, when students were writing the written exam. This is one thing I like about accounting tax. Say you do the calculations separately with regards to your tax capital gain. And on the actual solutions we have, I'm just giving you an example. We have a taxable capital gain of about 40,000 rands, okay? And then when you do your calculations on your actual solutions, you've got a tax capital gain of 30,000 rand. The nice part about this when we're writing an exam, as written, not as multiple choice, we would give you marks for that simply because you have transferred the right amount that you have calculated. OK, that's what we call principle. OK, so exactly the same thing. It would happen to accounting. If you do your because we understand you can punish the wrong calculator due to time, the wrong, sorry, the wrong button due to time in the exam. We cannot punish you for that. We can punish you for if you say my taxable capital gain is 20,000 rand and then all of a sudden is transferred 10,000 rand. Then that's where we would say, OK, no, we don't understand what exactly you are doing. But then we go to your retirement fund contributions. You remember when I spoke about your pension fund, your provident fund? You remember that? It's there on lane of two, lane unit two. Donation. You remember when I said donation? It's actually 10%. So they say this and this and this has donated so much. All right. My understanding is not any donation qualified to be part of a deduction unless if it's a PBO. PBO, it means public benefit organizations. OK, I can't just donate the money to Virgin Active and I expect that to be edited. It doesn't qualify to be a deductible donation. But if I donate my money to UNISA because it's an NPO, then obviously it will qualify as a deduction. However, there's a little thing that has to be adjusted with regards to that, but we'll see that when we cross the bridge. OK, after that, it will give us what's called the taxable income. And there we go. Remember the tax tables that I spoke to you about? I know I haven't shown you that, but we're going to apply that. OK, that's what I'm saying that you guys are going to go back and forth with it as to don't worry about the tax tables. They will always give you that at the back of the page. You will always find it. Right. So let's have a look at our rebates and credits. You remember when I told you about the eight factor, your 65, less than, greater, 75 and all of those. This is where they would come. You would see that, OK, my person is a taxpayer. My person is actually at this age. What are the rebates that he actually qualified for? OK, you remember the thrice whole thing. It features in here. Medical scheme fees, tax credit, we'll touch base on that one. And then you're going to have another additional qualified medical expense tax credit. OK, and you're going to have what's called the foreign tax. Let's, give a, let's see it, what is it going to give us. We're going to get the normal tax payables, right? And then you're going to have the prepaid tax. These are the, usually these are the submissions with regards to your employer in regards to your tax to what's subs, okay? They probably do it like maybe twice. Once in a year they do that, and then that, that has to be, but they'll give you that in any scenario on, on, on your question. So you're going to have what's called the tax liability at the end of the day. So these determines whether you owe SARS or they owe you or you are actually on that bridge. Right. Tell you, let me tell you something. I know it's going to get a little bit complicated when you do the medical aid. However, I'm gonna ask you to take your time. When you do the medical aid, whether you are with me or whether you are on your own. It's not easy for everybody to understand the medical rebates at a call. You need to take your time, make sure you understand it, as whether you like it or not. Questions on medical aid, they carry a lot of marks, and they're going to be in your exam, whether you like it or not. And they are a bit confusing. I don't want to lie. OK, I think that's going to be the next segments that we're going to be touch basing on, on it. All right, we've dealt with the framework. 
Mkumuti said, I would like to know whether local interests received and foreign interests are treated on the framework. Are they exempt or do they fall under allowable deduction? How are they treated on the framework? Foreign interest or foreign dividends, obviously with the dividends we've got a special calculations that has to be there, but they are going to be part of your framework, not as a deduction. However, as an income. Remember when you've got an interest income or when you've got a dividend, that's an income that you are earning, not as an interest expense, which is why it's forming part of your income, not as an expense. Right, let's have a look at the medical tax credits. Right, individuals who might Individuals must belong to a medical aid member for their contributions to be regarded and be deducted from the medical tax credits. Right, um, the individuals must belong to a medical aid member for their contribution to be paid and be deducted from their medical tax credits, and they must form part of their rebates deducted from the normal tax payables. Right, and I also mentioned that the age and the disability have a major impact for the medical tax credits. Okay, so these are one of the basic things that you must consider when you do your medical tax credit. Okay, you must be a medical aid member. We have to look at the issue of your age, and we have to look at the issue of you as a contributor, you are disabled, or your dependents are disabled. And if there are no disabilities, that's okay. We're going to look at the issue of your age. Okay. Uh, I'm going to scroll now, and then if you don't see my screen, you can just let me know. We've got two types under your medical tax credits there. The first one is the medical scheme tax credits. It says that it's a non-refundable tax prepaid, which reduces your normal tax as a, as, as a person's pay. And it says that any portion exceeding the normal payment not allowed in the current year must not be carried forward towards the next year of assessment. And here we go. This is basically what they say. For example, let's say you contribute about 20,000 rand a year towards your medical aid, inclusive of your um, beneficiaries, or what's the standard we use in tax? Dependents. Okay. Let's say your medical scheme tax credit amounts to a below amount. Let's assume that it's 20,000 rand. You're not going to get any refund on that one. It's not even going to be carried forward to the next year of assessment. It's just going to stay as it is. Clear on that one. Um, I think, um, Anneli, so you must also consider this one when you said that you had a bit of an implications when it comes to your submissions as well. Okay, let's have a look at number. The other one it says the additional medical expense tax credits. It's also non refundable. It is based on reducing your normal tax that the peasants pay. One second point says that a portion that is not allowed in the current year of assessment cannot be carried forward to us. The same principle would apply to this one as well. It is calculated against all the qualifying medical expenses as an out of pocket expense paid by the taxpayer and their dependents and given as an additional scheme fee tax credits. Let me tell you what's the difference between these two. The difference between these two here is your medical aid, the first one, your, your medical aid will entirely cover your health and the second one is there will be a shortage when you consult. At some point, you have to search in your pocket. That's basically what happens with regards to the difference in between the two. The other one, it's called you pay out of your own pocket, but not 100%, just as an addition. Okay. And um, actually, this one, it makes sense now because I've signed up with an independent my employer doesn't pay for my medical aid, but I've signed up my own independent medical aid recently, and they have, they explained exactly what I'm showing you on my screen. Okay, so basically what you do is I don't pay when I consult. I pay an additional amount so that should I consult and be in a shortage, I will deduct out of what I have with them in the bank account. I don't know if that makes sense. If I go and see the doctor now and my medical aid says, okay, let's say the doctor says your consultation is 50 rands 
the medical aid said, OK, we can only pay 30 rands, meaning that I have to go out of my pocket and add that to make it 50 rands. But in my case, I'm not going to do that because I've got a spare amount somewhere lying in the company account. So what I'll do is I'm going to have a card where I will draw and then I will pay my my doctor as an addition. OK, uh, point three say it is calculated against the qualifying medical aid, medical expenses paid as an order. OK, I've read that one. Page 47 has a list of the defined spouse list and what's called the disability. I'm just going to pause on that one just a bit. Let's look at the qualifying criteria formula. Right, there are formulas that you need to comply with. Thus, when you're given a transaction or a scenario, you need to know exactly that what, what where am I or which part of this um, scheme, tags, medical, am I falling under or am I going to deal with? Is it an out of pocket or is it just an ordinary? I call them that way, right? So your qualifying criteria says, a person who is 65 years of age and greater, I was supposed to greater, I said great, sorry about that. So this is the formula you're going to use, 33.3% multiplied by A, okay? minus into the bracket which is a three multiplied by b and then you close the bracket plus c do not be confused about this i know we're purely not doing maths here it's tax but it would make sense when we see how it appears right so a person who spouse a child with a disability is 33 percent times three multiplied by a minus into the brackets of three multiplied by b plus c okay you can see that there's actually not that much of a difference between the a and b but all other people who, all other persons who do not qualify would be above category. This is where the formula gets to be a little bit tricky or different. So it's 25% open brackets A minus open brackets 4 multiplied by B plus C minus 7.5, sorry, minus open brackets 7.5% multiplied by the D. Let's look at what does this alphabet mean? Because 33 and 25% will always be there. OK, that's how we do in terms of the qualifying criteria or the category. My A represent the fees paid to a medical aid. Sorry, medical scheme fund for the year of assessment. My B is my MTC for the year. I think is the best category. And my C will be all the qualified medical expenses paid during the year of assessment. I think these would be what? These would be out of your pocket money that you are actually paying. Right, let's look at a D, taxable income, excluding the retirement lump sum benefit, withdrawal benefit, and severance benefit. Do not worry about these figures and multiplications, the percentages and stuff like that. You will get used to that. At this point in time, what I'm going to ask you guys is please worry about the process. Please do worry about the principle. If you get the principles right, there's no way you can fail on how to manipulate this formula. Right, by you knowing the transactions belong to one, two, or three as category, it will help you a lot. This is the table that I've been singing the song about with regards to its weights. Okay, so nobody in this country doesn't fall under this table. But for some of you, they do fall in there. You see where you fall. Okay, so category number one is 18% of your taxable income. You should be between one and 205. Okay. But the chances are any amount below 205, I will just verify that. I don't think you will qualify to can pay your tax. Right, 205 to 321, 600. But I want us to do this question quickly. I'll show you on how did they do it, on how to calculate the taxable income. All right, if you look at example 201, it says, this, let us assume that a taxpayer's age taxable income for the current year of assessments amount to 120,000 rands. Okay. And um, in this text tables, we see that it falls within the category of, okay, so it means anybody below 205 is paying 18% of tax rate. Can you see that? So all you do is just 120. Let's go to the table. I just want to show you something quickly. So this person is any 120. This it means this person falls here. Yeah. yeah. So all you do is 120 multiplied by 18%. That means this text, uh, the tax that this person must pay per annum is 21,600. Right, let's have a look at it because it's a bit different to the first one. Example 2.2, .2, it says 
what is the normal tax if the taxable income is 230,000 rand? When you get something like this, you are forced to go to the table. The question is, what do you do? All right, it's 230. Can you all see that? So meaning that this person falls under the second line item. Can you see that? It's 230. 230 is somewhere in between 205, 901, and 321, 600. All right, this is how they do that. They said 230 minus 205, and then the rate it says is 26%. Can you see that? Yeah. Are you happy? Minus 205, 900, which is this one. Then you multiply this by 26%. Can you see that? Under this text tables here, they say that it should be plus with an amount of 35,253. It's there on the table. Um, I think I'm picking the wrong okay, it's two okay, two thirty minus all right. This is let me see eight plus all right. You would say two thirty minus two oh five, it should give you twenty-four thousand one hundred. Multiply that by twenty-six percent. Somebody with a calculator quickly. Can you just do thirty-five two five three plus six two two six two double six three seven zero six two? You multiply that by, I think they were supposed to say 37062 plus an adjustment of 24,100 multiplied by 26. 24,100 multiplied by 26, and you divide this by 100. Okay, that's 6266. I just want to check something. Plus 37062. Let's do this. Um, can you say, all right, can you say 24,100 multiplied by 26%? Tell me how much is it giving you there? 24,100. 24,100, yeah. Times 26%? It's 662,600. All right. Uh, just note it down there for me, please. Okay, you said it's 66? Six, six. Six, 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 six to six. Six double zero. Six two six six double zero. Yes. No, six two six. No, it can't be. Are you saying that it's sixty two thousand six hundred? Yes, twenty four thousand one hundred times twenty six. Divided by hundred, twenty six percent. Oh, divided by hundred. Yes. And then it's six thousand six thousand two hundred and sixty six. Six two double six, right? Yes. Okay. And um, mm, let's say 205,900 multiplied by 26. Say 205,900 multiplied by 26%. Multiplied by 26%. It gives me um, 51,475. 51,475. Okay. Um, something is actually not adding up for me here because the, if you look at example 2.2 .2 there, um, I'm talking to everybody now. Yeah? It was supposed to be 37,062, sorry, 37,062 plus 6266. All right, uh, do me 37,062 plus 6266. How much is the total there? Um, please repeat again. Uh, 37,062. Yes. Multiply, sorry, uh, plus 6266, sorry. Plus? Forty-three thousand three hundred and twenty-two. Okay, now I see it. Uh, say two thirty thousand multiplied by twenty-six percent. Two thirty thousand multiplied by. Should give you thirty-five thousand two five three. I think they want to take the lower between thirty-seven zero six two. Fifty-nine thousand eight hundred. Thirty-nine thousand eight hundred. Fifty-nine thousand eight hundred. Twenty-six percent of two hundred and thirty. Let's let's leave that one for now. But anyway, the process here or the principle says that um, on the income given, taxable income given, like in this instance is 230,000 Rand. What you do is you're going to first look at the table. Where does it fit? Obviously, it's going to be on category or line number two. 230 falls in between 205, 901 and 321, 600 Rand. Can you all see that? So what you're going to do is, can you see this figure at the end? You would say 
230 menu minus 205 900 that's what they did in here can you see above here and then you multiply that by 26 percent basically it should give you that but the figure doesn't correspond i'm not so sure why it only corresponded to 24,100. at the end of the day they got a total of 45,199. but these 45 sorry for 1519 grand that will be the taxable amount for the year or the normal tax amount for the year actually it will be the taxable payable for the year you see that right so when you get this kind of a question you need to have a look at your table as part of your taxable income and then you're going to look at where does it feed in this lines all right so wherever it feeds you're going to see their taxable in figure that is given minus these amounts at the sides any of these amounts at the size and then you're going to multiply it by these percentage and then you add this make sense can i add something sure i think the normal tax for that bracket doesn't correspond when when they did the calculations because it says three five two three i think that's where the problem is instead no, of three seven zero six two that's what I'm saying that this might be an errata, but I don't want to conclude on that one. Okay. I just have to see the primary lecture for this course and see if there's anything wrong on that one. OK, but okay. all I want for you now, I don't want you to focus on the wrong figures. It's not going to end you anyway. I want you guys to actually. Uh, what is it? Follow the procedure. Understand the principles. The principle says that you first get the taxable amount. You come here and look at where it fits. OK. And you're going to take that amount and then you're going to minus whatever the figure that you face on this line items. And then you multiply by any of these percentages and then you add this on a list. But you'll see that when we do it next week because there's going to be a lots and lots of questions. But in the meantime, I'm going to find out if there's a problem on my side because it's possible or there's a problem with whoever that prepared the guy. But this is actually one of the examples of the questions with regards to your uh, the tax payables. That's the starting point. Sorry, I wanted, I wanted to, to to comment on the example, the 2.2 example. The I two. did inquire about uh, I did inquire about about it, and I was told that the 35,253 was made in error. So the correct one is the 37,000 and 62, which is seen on the text table. Basically the one on top, right? Yes. OK, you guys had it. It means I was right. That's always a bit confused. It means my 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 calculations were actually quite right. Um, from there, I think we answered on that one. There's no need for me, guys, to actually can go and find out for you because I'm not, that's how I knew the protocol procedure when it comes to the principles, if you may call it that way. Right, instead of 35 or whatever the figures afterwards used, you can go to 37 because it's the one that is on the table. 